reigns. Amen. Our, hey, look at your neighbor and say, my God reigns. Oh, that was weak. Come on, look at your other neighbor and say, my God reigns. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we are so glad to see you this morning. Man, you would have been amazed at how many people were in the first service because they were on the other time clock. Amen. But listen, we've been talking about Elijah and the little widow woman. We understand that things were devastating. There was a drought, no rain, no food, no water. Cattle was dying off. They were in desperate times. Their economy was a mess. Amen. Scripture says that Elijah sent to Zarephath. There's a woman there gathering sticks. And Elijah says, go bake me a cake. She says, all I've, all I've got is a little oil, a little meal. I'm going to go gather some sticks and bake a cake and we're going to die. He said, go bake me a cake first. But I like what comes out of his mouth next. He says, do not be afraid. Isn't it amazing at how the enemy uses circumstances to intimidate us? Listen, I'm telling you, the enemy can bring up every circumstance, every bad outcome. I mean, he can bombard in a second. He can bombard our minds with a million things that are going to go wrong. But you know what? Elijah said, do not be afraid. Our peace, our provision does not rest in the economy. Our rest, our peace does not rest in who is in the White House. No matter what is going on around us, do not be afraid. Father, I curse fear. Fear about their jobs. Fear about their finances. Fear about provision for their families. God, fear about bankruptcy, fear about the economy. Lord, today you are, you are our provision. Our provision is in you. You are our storehouse, God. We thank you, Lord. We curse fear today. We curse fear today in this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, there's four live stations that you can give out today. There's three ways you can give on the screen. Would you get out of your seat and introduce yourself to some folks that you don't know today? I'm Will. We're interrupting your regular scheduled programming with some breaking news. That's right. We've got updates hotter than a fresh cup of coffee on a Sunday morning. Or cooler than a youth retreat in November. First up, Sunday, November 10th from 4 to 6 p.m., we have our youth small groups. 
This Wednesday at 7 p.m., our men's and women's Bible studies continue. And tomorrow at 7 p.m., join us for our Election Eve prayer and believe God for a breakthrough. Then, on November 17th, it's a one-service Sunday with Encounter Sunday at 11 a.m. After the service, join us for the Turkey Bowl and bring a side to share and enjoy sports tournaments, inflatables, and our famous chili, soup, and dessert cook-off. Don't forget to register for the games and cook-off. This just in, folks. Hold on to your pumpkin spice lattes. We have some news from the North Pole. Hey, thanks, guys. Look, this just in. We have an awesome opportunity for you to be an angel this year at Christmas. We are taking nominations from November the 3rd through the 17th for families who may not have the funds to have an epic Christmas this year. And we want to step in and make sure we give them our very best. So you can nominate any family that you believe might need our help from November the 3rd through the 17th, and then you can come and select any of those lists that we'll gather from those families November the 24th through December the 1st. And then we'll return those gifts wrapped and ready to go right here by December the 8th. Now, listen, if you love holiday shopping, this is your time to shine. But if you hate holiday shopping, this is my time to shine. So you can just donate online and we'll take care of the shopping for you. Now I have been asked uh, to ask you not to purchase specific gifts. Um, those would be bagpipes, pet tarantulas, chainsaws, an untrained pet dragon, um, broccoli favorite ice cream, bikes with square wheels, heels, dead plants, any um, it appears that we're having some connection issues. We're just going to move on to our last story. The Youth Winter Retreat is coming up. Registration closes November 11th. For all the details to register for events, click the QR code or visit mustangcreek.org forward slash events. You guys are a good bunch of looking people here. How many to know what today is? It's Sunday. Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We are appreciating our pastors. Pastor Judy, if you'll come up with Pastor and stand here. Uh, yeah, give it up for these, for these fine pastors right here. You know, there's a lot of things that, that we uh, and, and the church doesn't see that goes on behind the scenes. Um, for example, just one of many examples. They wear many hats, but the one hat of a construction manager or property manager or uh, water, uh, everything, remediation, uh, this guy has, has done it. For the past two years, a couple years, we've had the, the Grace Campus for sale. You guys know that. But what you don't know is that every week, pastor is going over there, sometimes multiple times per week, all the way to Mesquite to check it out. And uh, how many know the traffic from here to Mesquite is horrible? But anyway, that's beside the point. But he's going over there, checking it out, making sure that that property is in good condition. And so those are things that you don't see, but us as the board, because that is our investment. That property is this church's investment, and we appreciate you taking the time and you allowing him to borrow, borrowing uh, some time to go out there and check on it. So we appreciate you. Also, something you may not know is your pastor is kicking some booty in some fantasy football. All my guys that are, I'm telling you right now, he stays up. I, I think he like gets up at like two o'clock in the morning on Tuesday to draft players from the previous weekend. I'm like, I'm there and I'm like, he already got the player, but he's, he's kicking, he's kicking some booty right now. So I commend you for that. I'm coming, we're coming for you. But we, again, we just want to say thank you so much on behalf of the board. We have a special gift for you, a couple bucks, take her to McDonald's and just, no, I'm just playing. There's a little more than that. But we just want to tell you we love you guys and appreciate you so much. We would like to uh, ask you to step forward. We're going to stand behind you. If you guys can stand, we're not only going to appreciate them with the card, but we're also in love on them, but we're going to pray for them. Because how many know this world needs some strong leadership? We need strong pastors, and we have them here in Mustang Creek. So if you'll just, if you'll just stretch your hands this way, we're going to pray uh, for pastor. And uh, Pastor Judy, right now, Father, we just thank you for this wonderful, beautiful couple. You guys pray with me. God, we just thank you for them and their hearts and their life. And we pray that 
that, Father, you would continue to use them. God, that you, Father, that you would give them strength in their body to keep fighting the fight of faith. Father, that you would open up more doors of mission opportunities and more doors for speaking engagements, God. Father, we thank you for them. We thank you for their heart. We thank you for their love for your people. We thank you that they seek the kingdom for this church. They seek after uh, knowledge and, and, and power from above, God. And Father, we thank you that they will not be deterred by men, but they will continue forward in your presence for your glory and only your glory. God, we thank you for this beautiful couple and wonderful family you've sent to us, and we just pray that you continue to bless them. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray. Amen. 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 We love you guys. Thank you, Pastor Robert and Judy, for being authentic and loving your flock. Thank you, Pastor Judy and Robert, for being very intentional with us. Everyone who comes through the door, y'all smile and greet us, and I just love that so much. Thank y'all so much for being y'all. Thank you, Pastor Judy and Pastor Robert, for all of the love that you've shown me in the four or five years that I've been here. You guys are amazing. Thank you, Pastor Judy and Robert, for unapologetically sharing the gospel the way it was meant to be shared. Thank you, Pastor Robert and Judy, for being willing to cry out to the Lord in the middle of services because you were moved by His Spirit and what He was doing for people and you wanted Him to do more. Thank you, Pastor Robert and Judy, for creating an environment where we can freely express ourselves in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Pastor Robert and Judy, for leading us so well, for loving us so well, for always having such integrity. You guys are wonderful pastors. Thank you, Pastor Robert and Judy, for loving us very well. Thank you, Pastor Robert and Pastor Judy, for being the greatest pastors on earth. Thank you, Pastors Robert and Judy, for being such loving pastors. Amen. Thank you for allowing us to be your pastors all these years. We absolutely love you, love being here, love the atmosphere here, love the people here. And so uh, thank you for your kindness, your kind cards and gift cards and uh, hugs and text and all of those things. Thank you for, for loving on us well. Amen. Uh, hey, we're going to do something different today. Pastor Judy and I are going to tag team a message today called Landmines. Mm. Anybody know where we're going today? Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, script, uh, the, the scripture, <laughs> it's almost scripture. Uh, two things you don't discuss. What are they? Religion and politics. And we're going to talk about both of them in the same service. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right. Come on, Pastor Judy, read us that scripture today. I'm going to read you out of the book of Matthew. This is on the Sermon of the, on the Mount. This is where Jesus is talking to all of these people, and he's laying out some specific things. Matthew uh, chapter 5, you guys have it. I'm just going to read it off the screen. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, I think. We'll begin there. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, today we curse the spirit of offense. We curse the spirit of division. Father, we curse the lying tongue of the enemy today. Father, I'm believing you that the comforter is moving in right now. That the spirit of wisdom and revelation are moving in right now. The spirit of understanding is moving in the house right now, Lord, and across the airways right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your help today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we want to, uh, I, I want to set this thing up today. Uh, a lot of people have asked, how in the world can you talk about politics in the church? You, you talk about uh, these things 
uh, on the platform. You shouldn't be talking about these things in the church. Someone came in this week and they were just so precious and tears welling up behind their eyes and say, you know what, we cannot stomach this individual, but we, we can't stand these policies and just, uh, just a, a tug of war going on. Let me be clear today. Pastor Judy and I cannot stand either candidate that is running for office. Jesus is not on the ballot. See, I just made the whole room mad in one sentence. I just talked about both of your candidates at the same, in the same sentence. I knew you would. <laughs> Listen, I want to be clear. We do not like either candidate. But here's the deal. I want you to understand that we, we are living uh, with this phenomenon where people are voting on personalities. Likeability factor. Guys, please hear my heart today. Personalities will come and go, but platforms will last for generation to generation to generation and affect our children and our grandchildren for generations to come. So today, listen, I, I know you're sitting there going, why in the world would they talk about politics in the church. I, I want to be very clear today. I want you to understand that the church and politics, the church didn't ease over into politics. I need you to get this. The church did not ease over into the lane of politics. Politics has eased over into the lane of the church and then told the church to sit down and shut up. The, the, the culture today has either intimidated us into silence or shamed us into silence. Or you, you understand what I'm talking about? And I want you to understand that they stepped out of line we did not. What do I mean? I want you to understand that politics today has stepped out of line. They have responsibilities, things that the government are responsible for. And those things are things like infrastructure. Those things are, are like uh, uh, safety for the people. Those things are like public education and those kinds of things. But they have stepped out of their lane into legislating and redefining morality. And if we don't agree with them, then we, something's wrong with us. We're extremists. You know what? <laughs> Jesus was an extremist. He looked at the leaders of the day and said, I am the only way. Come on now. And here's what we have to understand is what is truly happening is they are trying to redefine what truth is and legislate a new sense of morality and then indoctrinate our children with that new sense of morality. And the truth of the matter is, is our kids see it every single day on every TV show, in the halls of their schools, uh, and they don't even think there is a moral issue. Why is that? Watch. I, I want you to get this. I want you to get this. The scripture here says that we are the salt and the light. Salt is in those days uh, was, uh, uh, was sprinkled over food to delay the decay. Listen, the church has a responsibility. I want, you, you may not agree with this, but I'm going to tell you the, the understanding that I have of the Scripture. Uh, first of all, the Scripture says that there would come a day when men would no longer tolerate sound doctrine, the sound truth of the Word of God, right? What does the enemy do? His primary tool are lies. 
But the spirit of truth opens our eyes and helps us to see the strategies of darkness, right? And so there's a, there's a passage of scripture that says, He that doth let shall let until he be taken out of the way. I believe that is the spirit-empowered church. Uh, I believe uh, that it is the church's uh, responsibility uh, to stand in the way uh, of the wicked schemes of the enemy and hold the line. It's the only thing we, the light, we are the light now. We are the salt now. We are the only thing that is hindering the plans of darkness and the satanic plans to go to go roughshod over our nation and around the globe. Why do we talk about politics? This is not a political issue. This is a spiritual issue. They have spat on the truth of the Word of God and tried to redefine morality and say the Bible is outdated. They have stepped out of line. Government has stepped over the line and tried to legislate a new type of morality. Here's, watch this. Why do we talk about politics today? We're actually talking about truth versus lie, lies and light versus darkness today. But I want you to get this. We live in a representative type government. Mm. A representative type government means that we research, we search, we find out who closely, the closest possible platform that aligns with the word of God, and then we send that representative to the halls of Congress to represent our Christian spiritual values. Last cycle... This is documented. Somewhere around 40 million Christians did not vote. And if we don't stand up for the values of the Word of God and say, no, you will not spit on the Word of God. You will not make the Word of God irrelevant in our culture. You will not redefine uh, all of these things and rede uh, redefine morality. Uh, if we don't send, stand up and send a representative uh, that will represent what we believe as the truth of the Word of God, somebody else will stand up and send their representative. And that is why... We are arguing unisex bathrooms. Come on now. Because the church didn't do its job and hold back the darkness. So I want you, I want you to get today that this, the reason that we are here, Pastor Judy and I are discussing these things today is because it is a spiritual matter. It is because it is our responsibility as believers to stand up and not be silent. And say, you know what? It, it is not hateful uh, if we don't believe what you believe. If we disagree with what you believe, now it's being called hate speech. You know what? It's love speech. But the scripture says, speak the truth in love. But it still says, speak the truth. And today, that's what we want you to understand, is we can't stand the candidates, but we have to pick the platform that most aligns with the word of God. Thank you, Pastor. I tell you, when I think about the concept of standing in a holy place, because we consider this to be a holy place, Amen. and literally presenting the gospel, the truth, and politics. It just sounds real confusing. 
But what I want you to understand is that God requires your pastors to discuss all truths as it applies to you and based on the Word of God. We would be doing you a disservice if we tiptoe around, we hide in our holiness, and we do not stand up and proclaim, thus saith the Lord. Everyone that comes and asks, how should I vote? I don't know how to vote. I don't know what, I don't know what I'm going to, uh, which one I'm going to pick. I don't know what to do. How do you know? The Word of God, uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Take refuge in Him. God gave you the brilliant mind of Christ. God has given you the ability to read a platform, to reason the action and the result, and to make a decision and vote according to that. It's hard sometimes because you hear all of these people saying different things and you don't know who to believe. Don't believe any of them. Believe the Word of God. Believe what he says, because nine times out of ten, they're going to do what most politicians do. Listen, most politicians tiptoe around the truth, and they say what they have to say to keep the people happy. All their constituents. They want to make sure you're happy so you'll vote for them. But in the church, Pastor and I don't have the privilege of doing that. We don't get to tiptoe around and say what you want to hear to keep you happy because I don't need to please you. My assignment is to please God. And if I please God, sometimes you're not going to like it. Thus, landmines. Any one of these topics would be explosive, but put all of them together and we have a landmine field. Yeah, and sometimes... Sometimes it blows up. You may not hear about it, but sometimes there are a lot of things that come into the pastor's office and they're like exploding. And we have to ask God for the wisdom to understand that in this church at any given time are so many people from so many backgrounds, different socioeconomic, there there are different nations, different tribes. There are so many different people here. We all came from a different place that shaped and formed how we see politics. But there's only one word of God. You know, the truth of the matter is that it's said that we view everything through our lens of experience. How many know that if all of our experiences are different, then we've, we've got a messed up society because we're viewing things through our lens rather than through the lens of the truth of the Word of God. But if I take it all back to the Word, I have to realize that it is my faith that defines my life. I don't know about your faith, but I will tell you what I believe consumes me. My faith consumes my thoughts, my actions, my feelings, my emotions, everything about me for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Everything about me, every breath I take, everything I do, including casting my vote, will be based on the Word of God. It is the safe refuge, it is the solid truth, and it will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. All of this, will pa- all the policies, all the pol- politicians, all of it, it's all going to pass away. But His Word will stand forever. There's safety in that. Something that I learned a long time ago is, you know, our government has specific laws. Yep, it's interesting if we think about it. What well, now, Pastor? You know, y'all aren't supposed to be talking about this in church. Listen, I'm just going to throw this out at you. I did learn in school when I went to school. They still taught history and government, and I understand the whole concept of separation of church and state. Take a deep breath. That is simply a part of a clause that discusses the fact that our government cannot force us to follow any one religion. Our government cannot favor a specific religion and say, all of you have to be that religion. Thank God, because I would not fit in in some of these churches. I'm going to be for real. 
But what it was saying is simply that the government doesn't have the right to enforce religion. We have it messed up. We're afraid we're going to lose religion if we speak about the government. We, the people. Let me, let's go back. We, the people, decide who goes into the White House, who goes into the governor's house, who is our mayor, who represents us on the school board. We, the people. And we, the people, are going to have to realize it has to be a decision made based solely on the Word of God. Not who I like, not who looks good. Did you know that they're trying to tell us now that they believe, you know, that some presidents are voted uh, uh, into office based on how good they look? Oh, Lord, let me just tell you right now, we're in serious trouble. If that's the case, we're in serious trouble. Now, I tell you, if this man, if he was running, I would vote for him. But the problem we have is that our church family does not want to be involved in politics enough to step up and say, here am I, send me. It's not even that. I mean, if we could just find a few of us who would say, I'll get involved in the schools. I'll get involved in the, uh, in the politics in our city. I'll get involved. I'll do it. But we even have people in our church who literally ran for different positions. And, and not any, I would say maybe 20% of us even voted. We are saying they won't do what we want. Well, that's because the more people spoke up. And we remain silent in the church. So we're, we're tired of it. It's, it's, it's our right, our privilege to discuss our faith and what we believe. And more of us should be doing it loud. We're the salt. We're the light. It is very dark out there. We got to turn it up. We got to help people find their way. So we Pastor also have... Judy, I want y'all just to understand that the... The authority structure has been turned upside down, just like in the home. And it's supposed to be the father, the mother, the child. The authority structure has been turned upside down. It's the child, the mother, and the dad now. An inverted authority structure wreaks wreaks havoc and is evil, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what we have right now is we have politicians, we the people, and God. Uh, turn that upside down and the authority structure should be God, we the people and then those that represent us thank you Pastor that's true when I, uh, when I say it's necessary for us to figure out who to vote for based on their policies it's really simple I'm, g- I'm going to make it so clear that it won't be a problem what, what you have to do is you have to decide first of all you're going to vote why are you going to vote because Christians need to make our voice heard okay but my vote's just one it doesn't matter if it's just one let me tell you what pastor and I are not going to stand up here today and tell you go to the ballot box and vote for and give you a name we're not going to do it you want me to tell you why? First of all, it is your responsibility to research that, to spend time with God and let the Lord lead you and the Holy Spirit give you direction. And the second reason is because when you stand before God, He's going to say you lived in a country that gave you the right to vote and affect the, the city and the country that you live in. And what did you do with that vote? And you are not going to turn around and say, well, Pastor Judy said... I'm not going to answer for you, but I will challenge you that if you have the ability to speak up, it is time to speak up. That's all I'm going to say. Now, how do you research the platforms? Oh, that's so easy. Everybody can do this, even a two-year-old. So if you're in there, I'm going to help you out. G-O-O-G-L-E. You just put that in your computer. And pops up with this line, and you can put anything in the world in that line. It's kind of like asking Siri, hey, Siri, do I look good today? Siri's going to come back and say, "Uh, I can't really see you, but I'm sure you look well. You always look well. Google is going to say, you're going to put into Google, I would like to see the platform for this candidate. Their platform and their policies. Then read them. And then take the Word of God and set it right beside your computer and read it. And if you don't know how to find that out, let's just say you're going to try to figure out about the economy. You look at that, you see what their plan and their policy is on the economy, and then you go right back up to G-O-O-G-L-E. What does the Bible say about the economy? It's so easy. 
Even a two-year-old can do it. Then you take that and you compare them. And the one that is most closely aligned with what the Word of God says, that is the one that you check off. That's the one you vote for. But how, I, I don't understand. I can't, I can't even stand the people that are up there. I don't want either one of them. You're right, but the only choice we have because no Christians are running, that's all we have. So you're going to have to figure out which one of them gives us the best opportunity to decay to delay the decay, to push back the darkness. Which one gives the church more freedom and opportunity to do that? And I'm not telling you which one. I'm telling you to go home and do your homework because you may be surprised because some of them are, this one's better, this one's better. So you do your homework. But one thing I can tell you is God is sovereign. He, he's God all by himself. People ask me, what does that mean, sovereign, that big word sovereign? I want you to put your finger up and snap. Ready? Here we go. He is God all by Himself. That's how you remember what sovereign is. Sometimes in my prayer, I say, God, nobody else can do this. You're the only one that can do this, and you're going to have to do this all by yourself. Faith just wakes up on the inside of me. It's something about a snap. I don't know. Something about it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So the one thing we're going to have to realize is it doesn't matter if we don't know what to do. The sovereign God can tell you what to do. You just simply have to make yourself available to hear him. The interesting thing is that there will always be an end. It's coming. But can we delay the darkness long enough to reach the lost before the end comes? I would so much rather Jesus come, Jesus come, Jesus come. But there are still so many who need to know his name. And we need time and freedom to do that. Okay, I'm going to keep going because I don't want to get in trouble on time. But I so appreciate Pastor helping me with this. Uh, I think he gave me the hardest challenge, though. Uh, Because I'm going to address the issues, but I don't believe he can remain silent while I do that. So so I'm going to let him tag in, and I'm going to love him anyway. Our ability to speak the truth to evil is going to be decided by our vote. In this election, our ability to declare, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, it's going to be determined by my vote. I'm going to keep going and make sure that I understand, but you're going to have to take and look. Proverbs says, listen, there is a way that seems right to a man or a woman, but the end thereof is death. Sometimes we look at these policies and these platforms and they sound so good and we think surely this is the right one. But the word of God teaches us to be careful to rightly divide the word of truth and apply the truth to these. And when we do, we may go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We may have to reconsider what we thought all along because there may be a way that seems right to us, but the sting on the other side of it, it's not good. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to reveal truth. So I'm going to start with just a few of the policies. I'm going to go through them very quickly, and then Pastor going to tag in. Let me just just say this. But I love it. He's invited to do this. I, I want you to understand that... As Christians, we're supposed to have sympathy and empathy and compassion, all right? But I want you to understand that having empathy is not always loving. Weaponizing empathy, which is what politicians do, which is what the enemy does when they weaponize empathy, don't you, can't you see my position? Can't you feel my pain? Can't you see it from my eyes? And if you don't agree with me and affirm my position, then you are speaking hateful. You don't love me. Empathy can be weaponized, and empathy is not always Loving compassion. But the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. 
He has given us his divine nature and the ability to love the way God loves and speak the truth. Okay, the, when we talk about the first one, we're going to simply look at the economy. Now, usually, if you talk about people's money, that's really a very hot topic. But if you ask me right now of the topics I'm going to be discussing in the next few moments here, <laughs> this is the easy one. Economy. Look and pull up their platforms and their policies. Read what they say about the economy. Make a decision based on what they say as it relates to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says that it is required of us to have just scales. To live in a way and do our books in a way that is honest. The Bible says that we're, good, we're to be good stewards of everything that we have. It's interesting to me if I ask myself, does this person and their policies and their operating processes, do they budget well? Because it is my money, it's God's money that he gave to me that I would like to say I give to them. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. My taxes are going to be spent on something. And there are things they are spending my taxes on I don't want them to use my holy money for. Amen. So I need to look and see what are they using my holy money for. And I need to be careful. The Bible instructs us that we record honest numbers and that we make sure that we are transparent and honest in all of our dealings. And say it again. Actually, the Word of God says the rich man doesn't pay more and the poor man doesn't pay less. That everyone is treated the same. Isn't it amazing in God's economy when we tithe? He doesn't tell the rich man to pay 25% and the poor man to pay nothing? Come on, guys. Come on. You can't get better than the way God does things. Amen. You can't get better than the way God does things. That's why if you voted me in today, I would say I want us to all pay tithe. If everybody pays 10%, then our taxes would cover all our needs. God already has it already ready. We just need to convince our politicians to operate according to the Word of God. <laughs> okay, I just threw that in for free. Okay, I'm going to move on up. It's getting a little hotter. Can you feel the heat? If you, yeah, Somebody pick up a fan. Start waving. Because I want to talk about immigration and the border. <gasps> Here she goes. Okay, it's okay. Don't, don't panic. Immigration is it's something that can divide us, but I want you to look around in your family church. In our church, we have people from so many nations, so many backgrounds, so many colors, so, so many opinions and thoughts and reasoning. Yes, nationalities, but listen, here's what I know. I love every one of you the same. When you apply to become a member at Mustang Creek, don't panic. We're not going to ask you if you are here legally or illegally. We really are not going to do that. and put all, We are going to do what the Word of God says, and we're going to love the stranger in our gates. We're going to love. We're going to honor. We're going to respect you. We're going to be compassionate. We're going to be kind. We're going to surround you, and we're going to try to help you. But what we're not going to do is break the law. <clears throat> there are some things that we can do and some things that we can't. God is a God of order. And he established borders for specific reasons. If you go back and you look and see where God gave specific areas and uh, land to the tribes of Israel, he gave every one of them assigned borders. He's okay with borders. God's good with borders. He, he's not mad. If you look in the Word of God over and over, you will see where Joshua marched around a wall. Did she actually say wall? Yes, I did. Because uh, in the old times in the Bible, a lot of cities were walled for their protection and their safety. Because no matter what we do, there's always going to be a, an element of danger and trespassing, and violence, and drugs, and sex trafficking, and things like that that are going to come across the border. Not every person who comes across the border is a horrible person. 
Some of them are wonderful. They're my dearest friends. I treasure them. But we have to take into consideration that if we don't do things in our country in order, in a, in a kind way, but a way that works and protects us, we're going to end up in as much chaos as the place where people are running from. We have to follow the order that God put in place. And the, and the sad thing for me, when I think about it, I mean, there has to be limits on everything. But when I think about it, I believe in, when it comes to the issue of the border and, and illegal immigration and immigration, we've dropped the ball. It, I'm going to take us because we put people in place who cannot figure it out. It cannot be that complicated. They ought to be able to get into the Word of God and find the answer or spend time in His presence and hear the answer, but that's not the people we sent. We have people there who are there for political reasons, and they really don't care if we get this figured out. But what we can do now is we can begin to pray. We can shake the foundations of our government and ask them to get busy about what we sent them there to do, and that's to resolve this problem. It can work out in the favor of all involved. I believe that, but we need God's will. Pastor Judy, here's, here's what I want you to understand. Weaponized empathy... Okay, but what I want you to understand is that we can have order because God all through Scripture. Listen, guys, this thing didn't didn't start by the big boom theory in chaos. God is a God of order. God told the waters where to stop. Are you hearing me? He's a God of order, but he's also a God of compassion. And both can be true at the same time. Come, wait, y'all did not hear me. Both, they're saying they can't be true at the same time. We can be a country of order and a country of compassion at the same time. So take the Word of God and set it beside their policies as it addresses the border and vote according to the Word of God. I'm sorry, it's the same thing to me. Immigration, all of that... There is an answer, but I want you to look and see what applies mostly to the Word of God. I'm going to move on because we have a, several more we need to cover, and we're running out of time. I'm going to go fast, but I'm going to address this one because I think it's very important. On the ballot, your vote will determine the sanctity of marriage. Mm. Now, now, what do I mean by the sanctity of marriage? To God, marriage is a very holy covenant. Marriage is the thing he uses as an example of Christ and the church, the bride. God set marriage in place. God created marriage. Men and women did not. It is a God thing. But it is a God thing between one woman and one man. And when we start saying, oh, that's okay, oh, that's okay, that's okay turns into an absolute perversion of the intention of our God that one man would leave his home and cleave to his wife. The two would become one, and they would develop, multiply, and be fruitful, and there would be more Christians in the land to vote. Here's what we have to do. We cannot allow our government to redefine the guidelines. When the government can arrest people who refuse to make a cake for a same-sex marriage, they're crossing the line. When a government, at one point, any time, your pastor could be arrested because he refuses to do a wedding ceremony for a same-sex couple. He could be arrested and put in jail. Now, if you do not vote God's purposes, precepts, and plans for this, then I'll be contacting you to help me with the bail to get him out of jail. <laughs> it's important that we realize which platform lines up closest to the Word of God. Do I keep going? I'm just checking. Uh, I, want, I want you to... Here's, a, here's two principles that you need to hear. The first and the underlying lie the first and the underlying lie. I want you to understand, if you want to know what God's intention was when he created and spoke something into being, go back to the first in the scripture because he's setting the tone. When he talks about marriage in the scripture, 
He said that for this reason shall a man leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. That was God's intention for marriage, right? If you want to know God's intention, what the scripture says, that's what the scripture says. The other underlying lie is the heart loves, the heart wants what it wants, loves who it loves, right? The truth of the matter is, is that because of our Christian faith and because Christ died for us, he takes the old heart out, the old cravings and desires out, and puts a new heart in man. Thank the Lord. I'm so glad you married me. Amen. Okay. I, I love you so much. I'm just like, okay, let me keep going because this is another real hot one. And, I, and I'm just, this one, there's no question in my mind. And so if you're offended, get offended. I, I don't care. Let's talk about transgenderism. What? Is she really going to go there? Yes, I am. Because I know without a doubt. Listen, the Word of God is a light it's a, it's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. It directs me. I hide the word of God in my heart so that I will not sin against God. I know that I live and breathe. Everything about me is defined by what I believe. You too. And everything I believe is based on the Word of God. And the Word of God is not a lie. The Word of God is the only thing that will last forever. Everything else will be gone, but the Word of God I can stand on, I can trust in. I will tell you that if it's not in the Word of God, then you need to look again because everything is covered there. Let me make it real simple for you. Obviously, you want to look at the platforms and the policies. You want to look at the Word of God. The Word of God says that uh, uh, our heart will deceive us. Our feelings will lie to us. I have to make every decision I make on the Word of God. Look at me. I want to set very clear boundaries here. Look into my eyes. If you have male parts, you are a male. If you have female parts, you are a female. But I don't feel like a female. I can't find any place in the Bible where it says you can be what you feel like. Sometimes I might feel like a dog. I'd be a cute one, though. I'd be a pippy with a cute little collar. No, let me get back to where I am. The truth is we cannot make light of this because it is being pushed and promoted and produced at the very youngest of ages. Our government is threatening to come to our home and take our children out of our home if we do not allow them at five years old to have a surgery that changes who they are. It's a lie. A surgery does not change who they are. You can do all the chopping and adding you want to do, but it's not going to change the DNA. Your God formed you in your mother's womb. Everything about you was decided before you were ever born. I was born this way. That is a lie. My God does not make mistakes, and everything that he has ever done has been perfect and right. You are a woman. You may be struggling and a little uncomfortable with that. There are ways to fix that. There are so many things. I used to wish that I was more feminine, so I would gather candles and put them in my car so I could smell pretty things. I would have flowers around me so I could see pretty things. I would go to Hobby Lobby and walk through, not because I love to shop, but I love pretty things. There are things that we can begin to teach the next generation. Be feminine, powerful, woman of God, but don't submit to the lie you're not enough or you should be something else. We need men of God calling a man out of a boy. We need people in the church to get active. Go and vote according to the Word of God. And the challenges that we face, we're going to have to speak up against them because who else is going to? And the underlying lie is God made a mistake. Church, listen, the underlying lie is to attack the sovereignty of God. And if God makes mistakes, if he made that mistake, then he can make other mistakes. The devil wants to take away the sovereignty of God in our hearts and minds. And that's the underlying lie. That the, Actually, let me, let me give you this. 
Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19 says, they became callous in their hearts and they gave themselves up to sensuality. That is, that scripture alone is an is a basis, I want you to get it, for several of the things that we're talking about, several things such as same-sex marriage, homosexuality, transgenderism, and even abortion, I will show you how that even uh, is, is a, a, an attack on the Scripture of God. They gave themselves up. The enemy opens the door. The enemy offers us temptation, and we give away. <clears throat> We give away our manhood. We give away our femininehood. Are you hearing? We were tempted. The enemy asked for permission. When the door is cracked, we have to give the permission. And then he steps in and takes control. But pastor, they're my friend. I love them. They really feel that way. How can I help them? If you want to help them, tell them the truth in love. Amen. Let's move on. We're going to talk about... Your compassion and empathy for them will not help them in eternity. Speaking the truth in love that there's deliverance, that there's freedom, that they were created on purpose by a loving God that doesn't make mistakes. That's truth. The government says they need help. They're dysphoric. They can't see themselves as anything else. And they may take their life because they're so depressed and unhappy being what they were not created to be. And I will tell you that after they go through all of the mutilation and all of that, they end up as miserable, if not more. And most of them, scientists proves out, attempt or succeed in suicide because the truth is is what they need to build their foundation on. Now I'm going to move on real quick, and I'm going to talk about the sanctity of life. By the way, if there's somebody watching or in this room that's struggling with that, come see us. Let us help you. We're not against you. We're not against you. We love you. We yeah. want to help you. Mm -hmm. Amen? We want to help you. Psalm 139, verse 13. Before I do this, let me say something real quick. Listen, you may read a portion of Scripture that you're familiar with, and you may read through it a hundred times. Listen, I have not only read this, I've memorized it, I've quoted it, and I've preached it. And still, this week, I read it again, and I saw something I've never seen before. So I want you to be careful when you open the Word of God to decide precepts and policies. I want you to read the Word of God with an understanding. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you things you need to see to make the right decisions. <clears throat> Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Because I know this is a sensitive subject, I want to just make one solid statement. We are pro-life. God is pro-life. He created life. He breathed life. He spent time strategically forming and shaping every human in this room. But I also know that in this room at this time, there are women who have had abortions and they carry that as a heavy weight of shame. I can't tell anyone. No one can ever know. It was a horrible thing. It was a stupid decision. I should not have done it. Or maybe they're saying, I did it, but you don't understand my circumstances. You are absolutely right, and I appreciate you saying that because I don't. But what I know is statistics prove out that one in four women will have an abortion in America this year. One in four. Count it out. One, two, three, four, one. It's out of control. It's totally out of control. God cannot stand. He hates the shedding of innocent blood. But here we go. Here we go. But you don't understand. You're right. I don't. I promise you I don't. I don't understand it. But I need us to come to a place where we can recognize that God loves life. 
Now, I can tell you the statistics say that over 667,000 babies have died this year in America from abortion. Now, if I have that number right there, everybody wants to step up and say, oh, but what about the exceptions? The exceptions for rape and incest and and the health of the mother. What about that? Okay, okay, let's leave that in. Here's 660 something thousand. If you do your research, you will see that the exceptions are this many. And you know what? We can, we can look into those. We can research those. We can even talk about those. But right now, I'm going to set those over here, and I want to talk about this. Because this right here, this is child sacrifice for convenience. This is, I'm more important than my mistakes. I can fix my mistakes. No problem. If I mess up, I'll just go fix it. No problem. I can just keep going. But let me tell you something. God said, I can help restore your soul. I can remove your shame. But when we do these things just because we can, it grieves the heart of our God. How he must be when he sees the decision made and no one in the church is out there helping them. Real fast, we're establishing a ministry right here at Mustang Creek. The ministry is going to be called Embrace Grace. We're working with a department that's going to literally set us up. We have some young women. I began to pray about this, and I said, God, I can't do it. I don't have enough time to do this. And God woke up some women in our church. I did not go to them. They contacted me, and they told me they wanted to meet with me, and they shared with me Embrace Grace, which I had already met the people. I already knew about the ministry, just didn't have time to do it. They want to do it. What's God asking you to do? They want to do it. And all it is, we're going to love the girls. We're going to bring them in. We're going to surround them. We're going to give them a baby shower. We're going to walk through them, do a Bible study, walk with them. And our church is going to receive them into our family. And we're going to care for them because that's God's plan. That is God's plan. I said a minute ago that in here, one in four has had an abortion. Let me help you out. One in four people in this room have committed adultery. One in four people in this room have told a lie. Probably much more than one in four. We, we try to set up and say this sin is worse than this sin. All sin brings death. The wages of sin is death. But, big eraser, the gift of God is eternal life. Pastor G, just y'all just to clarify. Abortion has become a thing because of convenience. The scripture I quoted a moment ago was that they have become callous because they've given themselves over to sensuality. Guys, listen to me. Sex outside of wedlock is still wrong. And we wedlock have, is marriage. Wedlock is marriage. And this convenience thing is demonic. It is demonic. The shedding of innocent blood God hates. So, go ahead. So, do your homework. Go home. Open the Word of God. Look at both policies. See which one. None of them align with the Word of God. In fact, I honestly, of all of the policies, that's what I mean, and the platforms, not any of them fully aligned with the Word of God. I have to choose the one that is closest to the Word of God because Christians didn't give ourselves Christians to vote on. Finally, this is the last one, so take a deep breath. I want to talk about Israel. And I want to talk about Israel because Israel is God's chosen people. From the very beginning, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God said, I'm going to bless the world through you. Everything that I believe has come from Father Abraham all the way into the entire nation of Israel. When I visited Israel for the first time, I could not help but tremble walking down the street and knowing I am in the holy land. 
I am literally in the place that God loves so much. Every single thing that has to do with all of history and all of future is all centered in Israel. Everything about it, the end time coming to pass, it's going to require that all the armies of the world turn against Israel. Man, I pray that's a long time. I pray we have a lot more time. But all you have to do is watch the news for a few minutes. Any news, I don't care which one you watch. You will see that Israel is the topic. And it is the thing that is being brought to the forefront because God is getting ready to return. And what we need to do is be sensitive to the fact that God promised to bless those who bless Israel and to curse those who curse Israel. So when we vote, we get to go in there with the mindset, which one of these platforms most closely aligns with loving Israel? Which one is a risk to Israel? Which one is supportive of Israel? What is God's plan and how does it affect how I vote? And we have to make that decision based on that. I'm asking you to think about this and consider this. I was born and raised in the United States of America, in the massively wonderful state of Texas. I was brought up in the city of Dallas in the neighborhood of Pleasant Grove, Texas. And from the time I could understand English, I know what it is to say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I come from the old school where patriotism was poured into you so much that you felt it the moment you heard the Star Spangled Banner. I love it so much that when I taught government in a private Christian school, I literally acted out that song, Oh Say Can You See by the Dawn's Early Light. I love all things patriotic. I literally feel Feel it in my bones. In our home, you can laugh if you want, but anytime we hear it or we see it, we stand up out of our lazy boys and we put our hand on our heart. Our dogs are mad there. We're just getting comfortable. They're moved and we stand up and we give honor to the country that we're in. I thank God for the gift of being raised here. And the patriotism that I feel overwhelms me emotionally. So this week... I was getting ready to walk into the voting booth. And I could feel my heart start to race. And I had done all my research, and I felt pretty confident about how I was going to vote. I wasn't sure, but I, I felt confident. So I walked carefully into the voting area. I gave them my driver's license, and I signed a piece of paper, and I got my ballot And I began to feel it even heavier. And I walked into that room where the computers are, and I sat down, and I put my hands on that computer, and I just began to cry. Oh, God, help me make the right decision. It's like I felt like for just a minute, all of it depended on me. What if it does? I put my hands there. I asked the Holy Spirit, lead me. Show me what to do. I've done my research. I think I know what you want, God, but I'm doing this with a holy fear because it is a freedom given to me that a lot of people do not have. And I'm asking you this week, if you have not already voted, would you feel the holiness of that moment, the responsibility of being salt and light? Would you feel that enough to walk into the voting booth well educated and ready to do the work of God in the political arena. Would you do that? Would you stand to your feet with me today? Pastor, I need to add one disclaimer. Yes, ma'am. I felt this when I wrote it, and I have to say it, so I'm going to say it. Don't be deceived by the media. Don't be deceived by social media. And don't be deceived by grandma. 
media. Listen to the voice of God. Amen. Church. We've all in these recent years been disgusted by the slippery slope of our culture. By the decay in our culture. By the redefining of what's right and what's wrong. And again today, I'm lovingly telling you that almost 40 million believers did not vote in the last cycle. And it's time for the church to stand up and say, Biblical values, the truth of the Word of God is still truth, and it's not outdated. And it's not outdated. And that scripture that we started with, he didn't light a candle to be put under a bushel. Why are we hiding under a bushel? Because culture doesn't agree with us. Because we've been intimidated and shamed into silence. Guys, hold the line. Man, I wish we'd have had that that clip from 300. Hey, any, anybody seen the Spartans 300 where, man, they, they lock arms, they lock their shields, and he said, hold the line. Hold the line. Delay the decay. Hold the line. Yeah. Hold the line. Hold the line. The Bible's still true. The Word is still truth. Father, Today I come again. And Lord, I repent if my tongue, if our tongues have stepped out of line in any way. You said it's a perfect man that offends none. Lord, we're not perfect. But your truth is still truth. And today we've tried to speak it in love. And Lord, I ask that your people would consider what's being spoken and they would be like the Bereans and would go back and look in Scripture. Father, we have no perfect candidates. Lord, we're grieved. We're grieved for our nation. We're grieved. But you raise up and put down kings. So today we ask you, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom, God. Unify us as a body. Yes, God. Unify us as a people. Yes, God. Lord, we curse the spirit of division, the spirit of offense. Help us to walk together in love. Lord, we thank you that we still have the truth of your word to guide us in our decisions. Help us to be wise according to your word and not wise according to the ways of the world or wise according to culture, but wise according to your truth that will never pass away, God. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for that truth today. And ask for favor and blessing and safety and courage in this people today. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. Everybody still love your pastor. Say amen. I still love him. Hey, we, before I turn this mic over, I have... I have a quick announcement, an encouraging announcement today. We've been talking about discipleship. We've been talking about vehicles of discipleship. How do we do life together? How do we build strong foundations and roots in the kingdom? And one of those ways is small groups. And God has raised a couple up that have come along beside us. And we have brought Daniel and Tiffany Gonzalez on 
as our new small groups directors. We're going to start recruiting, training, developing these small groups, and they're going to kick off just shortly after the first of the year. But welcome to the team, guys. Y'all get excited. This is going to be wonderful. Amen. We're All right. There he comes. Amen, church. Hey, listen, I want to tell you a practical way. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. is our first Monday night prayer, but we are rebranding it for tomorrow night, and it is Election Eve Prayer, and that is the focus. And so tomorrow night, I want to encourage you guys at 7 p.m. to fill this room, to come together, to cry out, to be one that is found standing in the gap for the nation of America. So join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. PM. And then if you have not become part of the Bible studies and what God's doing for discipleship on Wednesday nights, we have the mental madness that the men are going through and the Elijah study that the women are going through. This is a great night of growing and knowing Jesus more. So it's not too late. We are on week three this week that we're going to be doing that. And then finally, before we leave this morning, I want to draw your attention to the Turkey Bowl and Encounter Sunday because there are only two weeks left until this. And so we uh, have a chili competition, a soup competition, a dessert competition. So sign up for that. Sign up for the sports and the football and all the things. You can go to the QR code that's there or you can go online and go under events, mustangcreek.org backslash events and click Turkey Bowl and Encounter Sunday. There will only be one service that day, and the church is going to provide burgers and hot dogs and all the things, but you have a responsibility too, and that's to bring something to share and to get involved. It's a great time as a community. Listen, let's stretch our hands up to the heavens and declare uh, this morning this benediction. Say it with me. Teach us your ways that we may know you and find your favor. God bless you, Mustang Creek. Have a great day. We love you.